I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing and fiscal policy will fail is in the process of failing even if gold didn't exist if you didn't have gold as a you know multi-millennial monetary standard even if gold wasn't there as a reference point which of course it is but these policies are failing anyway and there are a lot of reasons for that you know whenever i hear you know fiscal stimulus I say, well, no, the Fed can print money all day long and the Congress can spend money all day long, but don't call it stimulus. It's not going to have any stimulative effect. We're way, way past the Keynesian multiplier, which is now below one, meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some numbers, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now uh, you know, a divide or something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New Keynesians, the Austrians and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning. Some do it more successfully than others, more <laughs> accurately than others, but they try. I was I would say that yeah, people say, you know, the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events, for what they see in the future. And yeah, they look into the future, here's the forecast, they pick out a discount factor, they they present value it and say here's where where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be, you know, six months or a year from now. And that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically, except they're always wrong about the forecast. You, you got to get the forecast right <laughs> if the discounting process is going to mean anything. So markets go through the process, but they always get the future wrong. They, they're, they're not very good at predictive analytics. So um, this creates what I call the gap between the perception and the reality. Reality always wins, but not right away. Sometimes it takes a while. Gold, on the other hand, as very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are going to be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, you know, result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's yeah. well, I, I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes. I go into the analytics behind that. I, as I've said before, you've heard me say I don't I don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. And there's a number of different techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So so you know it's got to go to three thousand before it gets to fifteen thousand. It's got to go to five thousand before it gets to fifteen thousand. So that's my kind of long range forecast but you know it could go down tomorrow and i'm like i don't get depressed when it goes down i don't get euphoric when it goes up i know where it's going in the long run that's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money you know, nothing wrong with making money i'm all for it but uh but sometimes preserving wealth you know risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run but uh, either way gold will serve that purpose and uh, you know and preserve wealth over, over that uh, over that time period could it go down tomorrow i guess yeah but all the vectors are pointing up uh, very strongly and i'll give you a, a concrete example there are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally uh one you've already mentioned which is real interest rates the lower the real interest rate the higher the price of gold number two supply and demand you know you learn it in your first three days in economics but it, it still works uh and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk you know, call it risk off or fear fact, whatever you want to call it, but I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, it, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, like really smart people, uh, Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all and I, fo I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history and short bonds and the interest rates have nowhere to go but up. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 
that's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever, but I usually use the 10-year note rate, a 10-year treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's about, about 70 basis points today, et cetera. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But, you know, I remind people 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings were tax deductible. And the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after-tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is, we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested in whether the Fed's going to pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland, Japan, and a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily wants to go there but you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year note just whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons it's a negative yield to maturity so you can get there you can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading regardless of what the fed does and that will happen and so you know in the dbo1 dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level rates gets lower that's just you know duration just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield of maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, and we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when, they, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation, and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as Exhibit A. I, we should probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. What is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%. But then it spiced to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy if you can convert savings into investment. And furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing. Uh, but I was, we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D, that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, the velocity is zero. And I remind people $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And so the question is, how do you how do you change the psychology? How do you get the and by the way, it makes sense to say if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried. Maybe I'm next. You know, maybe they fired a guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next. So maybe I better save more just in case you know, and so forth. So, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense, but understand what it means. It's deflationary. It reduces velocity. It offsets the increase in the money supply. And it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called a liquidity trap and he was right. That's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need, you need something big. You need something dramatic. That's going to get people to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, one of them would be a $5,000 price for gold. What do you think is, is, a, is a rational allocation right now for somebody who's at, at, at first and foremost trying not to get destroyed this year? Yeah, and to be clear, I don't give personal financial advice, but at a macro level, I'm happy to talk about what it is. Absolutely. What, None of this is personal financial optimal, advice. Uh, Definitely talk with an advisor, and I'm going to make that plug at the end here, yeah, too. <laughs> uh, portfolio might, might look like. Um, the first thing you say, diversification, the math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear. That's not much debate about that. The problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non-durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is 
yours, you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And then stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does the diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will do, that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies, uh, and not just gold, gold, yeah, but, um, I recently invested in a lithium mine. Uh, I think, I think, <laughs> I think the, the climate alarmists, I think the, I, I, the Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam, uh, and this is a scam, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs, whether it's, whether you like it or not. The fact is, uh, it's going to go on. So the lithium's in short supply, uh, graphite, you know, et cetera. So there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented that will, uh, do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Slug of cash, absolutely. Maybe as much as 30%. I like treasury notes, uh, 10 year treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five year notes, two year notes. They're going to come down a lot. Not right away, not tomorrow morning, but, um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is, uh, you know, a uh, recession and uh, interest rates will follow or lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Um, uh, gold, I always recommend 10% slice. Um, hey, hey Jim, real quick before we move on from bonds there. Um, so I've talked to a number of analysts investors you know on this program recently who have who have echoed what you just said there about bonds and you know there are two really good reasons to hold them right three really good reasons to hold them right now um one is just safety right this is a time to prioritize safety two they're paying a lot more than they used to pay so you're getting paid to sit in safety which is nice but then they have that that option value right where if 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 the um, fed does pivot and rates come down um, yields come down uh, the actual underlying price of the bond would go up. Right. And so uh, a number of these guys have said, you know, the bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the U.S. Treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. And, and, you know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious, does, do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a, I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO one DBO one is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math, interest rates come down, the value, the, the price of the bond goes up. They're just invert. It's a little counterintuitive, but rates come down, the bond goes up. The question is how much? And the lower the interest rate, the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're going to have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher. You know, as the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive, yeah, but, but it's sort of like a Richter scale. Each new increment is a much the, higher magnitude. The, 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 the lower the rate, uh, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. That's, the best of it. So yeah, when you're, you're you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, but I just thought that was a really important point to underscore. Yeah, I, I agree with the analysts who are saying that. Uh, absolutely. Okay, great. So on to gold, you were saying ten eh, percent ish. Ten percent, but you know, but, yeah, but based on what we were talking about, get. Um, I, I would get, uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah. The monster box, uh, you know, a bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, it's treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire, but inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. Um, they'll feed your family for, you know, probably a year. And, uh, it, uh, um, they run, you know, it's, it's a market price, but, uh, you know, be around ten, twelve thousand dollars uh, for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlights, you know, you just have one stick it in a safe place. All right, great. And I'm curious, do you have any uh, particular thoughts on silver versus gold right now? And you're, you're 
2023 yeah, outlook? Yeah, I, I like them both. And, you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and uh, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist, but I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's, there's no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at 3000 silver's going to be pushing 100 So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver's a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the, even the court, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American gold eagle, still 500 bucks. It's like pulling a $500 bill out of your wallet. You know, it's, it's a lot for groceries. Right. So, so, so the think of the gold more sort of the store of value and silver more is the, the currency. Yeah, but the quarter ounce, you know, maybe uh, 10 of them gets you a new car or something. So yeah, Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for bigger purchases. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's gold. I, I, I know in the past you've, you've said, hey, you know, real estate, private equity, farmland, et cetera. Those are all things to consider as well. Yeah, um, I think it, still- yeah, yeah, income producing real estate. I wouldn't get into commercial real estate, residential. Uh, yeah, the, the prices are, you know, um, home prices are coming down. Uh, a little more in some markets than others, but uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a, in a place like, you know, uh, some place people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know that they're, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but, you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in- income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. All right. Great. Um, I got one last topic uh, I want to talk about with you before I do anything else, just sort of on, uh, actually, let me ask this. So um, we talked there about sort of diversification largely with the eye towards sort of making it through what's coming here. Are there any areas that you potentially think are like, hey, given the events that we see coming, yes, while they're a little scary, there's some opportunity maybe to really if you, if you have some speculative capital, this could be a place that you think could pop really well. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, I, I like private equity, and it's you know you got to credit investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But um, you know that, that there are some uh, you know some good deals in the mining sector um, I like, uh, and um, uh, well that, that 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 would be one. I mean, we haven't. We haven't really talked about the important things going on, but we'll maybe do that in another interview. If one of our supply chains or one of another country's supply chains that we rely on collapse, it could cause an unprecedented economic super collapse on a global scale. And that's how we could end up with this $85 trillion economic super collapse I'm predicting. $85 trillion being the value of the global economy. Because remember, our current supply chain is interconnected on a global scale. If there is a single point of failure, the whole system is going to come collapsing down. Farming, banking, health care, oil and gas, tech, and so on. This isn't the first time I've warned Americans about this before. On May 11, 2020, I told my followers, the economy will not return to normal for years. There are serious constraints on supply. I issued another warning about my research on November 24, 2021. The supply chain difficulties will certainly grow worse. The remedies will take years and sometimes decades to implement, and yet another in 2022. Don't believe the happy talk about a temporary supply chain crisis. I'll say that again. The crisis will last for years with predictable negative effects on economic growth. But now things are even worse than ever before, and I fear this economic super collapse could hit American soil in the next 6 to 12 months. So this may be my last and final warning before it's too late. It's why I'm warning people around me it's only a matter of time before the world economy comes crashing down. Because when you talk about risk of catastrophic collapse, the risk increases with the size of scale. Look, whether you decide to listen to me today about how to prepare, whether or not you decide to get access to the information in this envelope, that's up to you. It's a free country. You can do what you want. You can even pretend you never heard me tell you any of this. But just know, Joe Biden certainly isn't going to come to your rescue. 
Take a look at this nine second clip from the president. When do you think things will get back to normal? When do I think things will get back to normal? But my hope is by this time next year, we're going to be back to normal. That clip was taken over 18 months ago. It's up to you what you believe, but I can't bury my head in the sand and ignore all the facts. And the facts couldn't be more clear. So in just a moment, I'm going to explain how you can get access to this information inside the envelope as part of my super collapse preparation package. I'm going to talk about what to do to protect and even grow your wealth. Look, please understand, it brings me no joy to say this, and I hope the worst of what I'm warning of never comes to pass. But there's only one potential solution to this crisis, and it's going to take years. Recently, I spoke to a very well-informed CEO of a major corporation, and I asked him point blank. I said, your company must be looking ahead of some possible solution. Is there anything you can share? Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing he told me. He said, Jim, you have to understand that it took us 30 years to build these supply chains. We blew it up in three years, beginning in 2018, and you can't put it back together. But there is one thing we can do. It's not a quick fix, but it's our best and most sensible option. Our only way out is to build a new supply chain that eliminates the bad actors. We can't continue to allow our enemies like China or Russia or Iran to threaten consumers here on American soil. As the Wall Street Journal wrote, Russia's lengthening war with Ukraine will lead to a near doubling of inflation rates in rich countries. It's why the New York Times wrote, this is what happens when globalization breaks down. And why Barron's wrote, secure U.S. supply chains with allies and move out of China. Unfortunately, this solution could take years or even a decade to fully implement. And that CEO told me it will take at least 10 years to reconstruct the supply chains if we don't want to do it with China and globalization. But whether you realize it or not, that's the bet we're making as a nation. It's happening now. And when the dust settles, we're either going to have rolled out this new supply chain before worst case scenario happens, or we're going to face whatever lies ahead from this $85 trillion economic super collapse. Now, maybe you're wondering how bad things could really get. Let me answer that question with another question. Do you remember your life at the beginning of the pandemic? Despite all of our freedoms we all hold so dear, an unelected official with the ear of the president recommended immediate lockdowns. And suddenly we heard demands like shelter in place or stay at home, backed up by the threat of arrest. Large swaths of the economy ground to a halt. Looting took over our towns and cities. Because so many businesses were shut down, people were emboldened to take to the streets. But if most Americans don't have access to enough food, water, or other necessary supplies, do you really believe our streets and our businesses won't see more violence? It's why gun sales keep hitting all-time highs as more and more Americans prepare for whatever lies ahead. And while I hope the worst of what I'm warning in my urgent new book never comes to pass, I don't suggest you rely on hope to protect yourself and your family. I'm certainly not. Here's how I'm ensuring my family's well-being. First, I would suggest stocking up on essentials, just like I've done. I have a fully finished area in the basement of one of my properties, the address of which I keep totally private. It provides me with a warehousing area for months worth of canned foods and other non-perishable provisions. That's important. Don't stop with a three-day supply like the CDC recommends. Make sure you have enough water, basic food, and toiletries to last at least three months. And keep them in a safe area where they can sit without damage or spoiling. I would also recommend buying several large capacity freezers. I already have three and I may continue purchasing more. If you have the means, consider installing alternate energy solutions in case of a worst case scenario. I've already installed the largest non-commercial solar power system in New England on my property. If you can, have alternative sources of power generation on your property. I've also dug three wells, planted abundant gardens, and built a significant greenhouse. But whatever you decide, do recognize that none of it will matter if you're not getting accurate information about what to expect in the coming days. Like I said, to be able to make the right decisions during a crisis, you need to lean on someone. So if that's not me, you should find another well-connected person you can trust, ideally someone who's previously held a position of power in our government. But if you want to learn what's inside this envelope and see what I know, right now is your chance. See, I've gone ahead and published this information I'm holding here in this envelope inside my newest book. It has brand new proof of the unfolding situation and inside level details on how it will play out. Urgent preparation report number one. Buy this asset after securing your family's food and energy. As the economy collapses and the shelves are bare, the government will respond by printing even more money. When it does, the value of the dollar will be destroyed through inflation. 
but 5,000 years of history proves that one item, gold, outlasts every other currency as a form of money. And I believe that economic collapse occurring right now will send gold skyrocketing over the next six months. That's why I'll send you my urgent report called The Perfect Physical Gold Portfolio. Everything you need to know about buying the right kind of physical gold as part of my super collapse preparation package. You'll find everything you need to know about investing in gold before the price blasts through the ceiling, including is gold safe to invest in? How much should I invest in precious metals? What metals should I buy and what should I avoid? What are the best places to buy gold and other precious metals? What are the safest ways to store gold to avoid theft or government confiscation? And much more. Plus, I'll also send you urgent preparation report number two, my Biden Bucks protection plan. I haven't mentioned it yet, but during my research, I came across a troubling executive order that President Biden just signed. See, every time there's an economic crisis, the government responds with massive new programs to try and control the economy and its citizens. In 2008, it was bailouts of big banks and new government agencies to regulate the financial industry. This time, it will be much worse. I've uncovered a plan for U.S. government cryptocurrency I call Biden Bucks that I believe the government will unveil during this economic collapse to control your money and manage the societal fallout. By the time this program is announced, it will be nearly impossible for everyday Americans like you to protect their wealth and keep their privacy which is why I've created another urgent report to get you prepared ahead of time. Inside this new report, you'll get step-by-step -step details on what these Biden bucks are, why they'll be used during this collapse, and how to outsmart this sinister program. By creating one, an off-the-grid fortune, secure $1.1 million in wealth inside a soda can safe. Two, saving your freedoms, have liquidity and spendable wealth without using Biden bucks. And three, growing your personal wealth, you'll get possible investment upside as events unfold. And four, ensuring you maintain your wealth regardless of external conditions. Building your own off-the-grid portfolio now will protect you from the government surveillance state coming during the economic super collapse. Biden Bucks testing is underway. The digital dollar could be rolled out soon. Before it's too late, make sure to protect yourself and your retirement savings. You'll find everything you need in this urgent report as part of my super collapse preparation package. But that's not all because you'll also get urgent preparation report number three. Secure this secret off the grid asset. You see, I've learned of another little appreciated asset that's a liquid form of wealth. It can't be tracked or traced. It's completely legal and easy to find if you know where to look. Over time, its value has steadily grown, but very few people know anything about its investment potential. You're about to be one of the few. I believe you must include this secret asset in any off the grid portfolio. I was having dinner with a friend not long ago in New York City. We met at a place called Oriol, which is in Midtown. My dinner companion that night was a senior advisor to BlackRock. As you may know, BlackRock is now the largest asset manager on the planet. It directly manages $5 trillion in assets, and it oversees another $11 trillion through its Aladdin platform. That means one firm controls more money than the GDPs of China, Russia, and Japan combined. Anyway, my dinner companion happens to work directly for BlackRock's CEO. As we nursed our white wine and the evening wore on, she let something slip. If I remember her words, she said something like, they want to tell us we can't sell. What was she talking about? Who was she talking about? I placed a few calls, first to my contacts in Washington, then to a few people on Wall Street. Soon I was on a plane for a series of meetings to London, to Geneva, back to New York, then down to South America. As I began connecting the dots, a pattern emerged. It revealed a network of more than 189 individuals positioned inside the world's major financial institutions. Some of them hold senior positions inside the IMF, World Bank, and every central bank in the G20, including our own Federal Reserve. These elites share one vision and they're about to make it a reality. That vision is one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. They've worked for years behind the scenes preparing to realize that vision. They've literally rigged the laws of international finance. Everything is basically in place right now, and there's essentially no way to stop this from happening. When the crisis hits, they'll flip the switch, freezing the global financial system. That will give them time to reset the world economy according to their vision. As the coming crisis unfolds, President Trump will be powerless to stop it. In fact, trying to stop them would probably weaken the president's power altogether. That is amazing, Jim, really. So what do these elites want from your contact at BlackRock? 
Basically, they want to classify BlackRock as too big to fail. The technical term is Systemically Important Financial Institution, or SIFI. That designation normally applies to banks, such as Bank of America. If your bank gets the SIFI label, it means the government will bail you out first in a crisis. But it also means you must turn over control of your bank until the crisis subsides. In this case, they're trying to reclassify BlackRock, an asset manager, as too big to fail. If they succeed, they'll be able to freeze BlackRock when the crisis hits. BlackRock clients won't be able to sell. They won't be able to buy either. Their accounts will go dark indefinitely. And the elite operatives will take control of BlackRock's assets remotely via the Internet. But our research shows that their ICE-9 plan goes much, much deeper than that. You refer to their plan as ICE-9. You just said that. What does that mean? It's a reference to the Kurt Vonnegut novel, Cat's Cradle. In the book, a mad scientist creates a new form of water molecule called ICE-9. When it comes in contact with other water molecules, it freezes them at room temperature. One drop of ICE-9 can freeze the whole ocean. And that's what these elite operatives are about to do to the world economy. Now. Can you share with our viewers exactly who these operatives are and what their ultimate goal might be? Like I said, John, more than 189 elite agents have slowly wormed their way into leadership positions across the board. They now sit at or near the head of the IMF, the World Bank, and even our own Federal Reserve. They also control much of what happens at the central banks of China, Russia, India, Brazil, Canada, and Europe. As you know, these institutions form a kind of global superstructure. It forms a kind of snare net encircling all nations. Their leaders aren't democratically elected. They're not accountable to you and me. They're beyond the reach of government and citizens, and yet they hold the fate of the global financial system in their hands. To get a sense of how they operate, imagine an array of floating spheres. One sphere is labeled IMF. One is labeled Fed. One is labeled Bilderberg. One is labeled Wall Street. One is labeled central banks, one is labeled intelligence agencies, one is labeled media, and so on. The elites inhabit all of these spheres, and together the network forms a kind of 3D Venn diagram. As I see it, regardless of what sphere they inhabit, the elites all share the same vision. One world order, one world taxation, and one world money. All of their actions are geared toward moving that agenda forward. Are you able to share the identities of these elites with our viewers? We've identified more than 189 individuals who are in many cases hiding in plain sight. Regardless, they all share the same vision. One world order, one world taxation, and one world money. A short list would include Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, IMF. Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England. Raghuram G. Rajan, Vice Chairman of the Bank for International Settlements. Haruhiko Kuroda, Governor of the Bank of Japan. William C. Dudley, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Augustine Carstens, Governor of the Bank of Mexico. Janet Yellen, Chairman of the Board of the Federal Reserve System. Mario Draghi, President of the European Central Bank. Zhu Min, Former Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Zhou Xiuquan, Governor of the People's Bank of China. Robert E. Rubin, Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. This A-list of central bankers and other elites is just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, not one of these elites will tell you outright what's going on, but I've seen and heard enough to connect the dots for myself. Not long ago, for example, I met with one of their senior operatives. He's the leading economist who served as the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the last crisis. He's considered one of the most influential minds in banking today. We met privately during a conclave in Seoul, South Korea. I came away from my meeting with him stunned and convinced that ICE-9 was real. Not long before that, I set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with another member of the network. His name is Zhu Min, the former deputy governor of China's central bank. Until recently, he served as deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Zhu is a brilliant guy, like Bernanke, and he's pleasant and well-meaning. There's no doubt in my mind that he's also a member of the elite network preparing to impose ICE-9 on millions of Americans. But I wasn't done with my research. I have since met with dozens of senior officials, intelligence analysts, and former Wall Street colleagues. My quest led to a final meeting, a face-to-face -face summit with the head of Bilderberg. We met at Rockefeller Center in Manhattan, and he was very eager to get my take on the euro as a currency. I was happy to provide it, of course, in exchange for some valuable intelligence. As I say in my new book, he did not have horns. In fact, he gave me a nice gift when we parted ways, a blue Swedish vase. I keep it in my writing studio at my home in Connecticut. But my point is I came away from all three meetings convinced of one thing. When the next crisis hits, the elites are planning to freeze the financial system, and they'll replace it with a new system, one not based on the U.S. dollar. 
When that happens, we'll wake up to a very strange and disturbing new reality. And for our viewers that are watching today, what might their reality look like that morning? How does this manifest? First, they'll have gone to bed knowing that a massive financial crisis was underway. But when they wake up, they'll find it has worsened and the contagion has spread worldwide. When they go to withdraw money, their ATM will say, close temporarily. When they go to sell stocks, their account will say, transaction not available. When they go to their local business, that business will only accept cash if it's open. As citizens realize they're being barred from their money, riots will erupt. It's going to get really bad really quickly. How would such a freeze actually work? And wouldn't that be highly illegal? Well, it wouldn't be illegal technically because they've been quietly laying the groundwork for years. They've rigged the financial laws, changed the rules of the game to allow this to happen. The stage is set. They have the levers in place. The lights are positioned. Now someone just needs to flick a switch and they'll impose ICE-9 rapidly. And again, all of this will be legal because they've rigged the system in their favor. Here in the U.S., for example, Congress pushed through something called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or IEPA. This allows the government to freeze accounts, assets, even whole institutions at will. The only condition is that there's some threat to national security with a foreign connection. Of course, with a global market, every financial crisis has a foreign connection. Any systemic crisis fits the bill. And the thing is, when the next crisis hits, it's going to be so bad, President Trump won't have any choice but to go along with the elite's plan. You have to admit, that sounds somewhat hard to believe. Now, how could these operatives actually freeze the whole country's financial system? Well, fortunately, we have some recent real-life examples to study. The elites have been conducting a series of dry runs for years, leading up to ICE-9. Look at Cyprus, for example. A few years ago, the Cypriot economy was in trouble, especially the banks. The IMF stepped in and loaned Cyprus $10 billion, but the loan came with strings. Now pay attention because this is precisely what they're going to do, but imagine it on a global scale. So in exchange for the capital injection, the IMF demanded control over the Cypriot banking system. More specifically, the IMF froze the entire system, literally every bank in the country. And they did that to ensure the IMF's demands were met, including strict capital controls. Jim, these insights resonate strongly. Our audience surprises me with their understanding of complex topics when we discuss them. Many are well-versed in these matters, easily grasping the crucial elements available to those who know where to look. You've recently recorded an exclusive video discussing an upcoming geopolitical shockwave, a major development in global finance since 1971. You also offer strategies for individuals to benefit from this crisis. Regarding the economic situation, you've pointed to the Biden administration for depleting our oil reserves significantly, surpassing all previous presidents. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine adds to these challenges. How much blame rests with the president versus supply chain issues? And as we're about 17 months away from an election, where do we currently stand? It's a great list, Brian, because you can say, well, we could talk about the war in Ukraine. Yeah, we could talk about monetary policy. We just kind of did go through some of the recession indicators. We can talk about the election, but they're all connected. I mean, that's really where the complexity theory and the density of the network comes in, because these things are all connected. So just to spend a minute on Ukraine, by the way, I just last week conducted my, I do this annually, so it's been eight years in a row, conducted a seminar on financial warfare at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it is at the Army War College, but there are people there from all branches. It's a very elite group, handpicked about 12 students, mid-career officers. So they're kind of late 30s, early 40s lieutenant colonels, and from all branches like at Marines, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and a few civilians, State Department and CIA, NSA, intelligence community. But it's a fun group. 1,213. I look at the resume. It's amazingly accomplished. They all have multiple master's degrees, the occasional PhD, speak four languages, been deployed from Iraq to Colombia or wherever, but they've been handpicked as the future big brains. These are people. Five years from now, There'll be three star generals on the National Security Council, etc. It's a fun class, and my topic is financial warfare, which is kind of like finance and warfare, which is what we're mashing up right now. And I spent a lot of time talking about this whole BRICS thing, and we can talk about that if you like. But I tell interviews like this, Brian, I always explain. I said I didn't say anything in the U.S. Army war colors that I'm not saying in this interview. It's not like I have a secret package for them and we do something else. I just say the same thing. You can take it or leave it. You can agree or disagree, but it's a great group, very interactive. But I was talking about the Ukraine war, and I said one of the most difficult things about this is getting reliable information in a war. Everybody lies, so the US lies. 
If you ask me what has surprised me about the war, the conduct of the war, the development, hasn't really been a surprise. Russia was always going to win. Just question how long. It's tragic. But I'm surprised at how many warmongers there are in the know. They're mushy. Germany's between a rack and hard place. Hungary is actually against the no. Again, a little. Sorry. The US has the warmongers, I know that. But starting with Boris Johnson and going to Rishi Sunak, I mean, they're more bloodthirsty than the Americans and they're the ones providing the challenger tanks, etc. I don't quite get it. I think all these Chamberlain, Churchill, Hitler metaphors fall down. I mean, I know history. I know what Chamberlain did. And I know Winston Churchill was one of the great heroes of the 20th century. But I don't see that parallel. Are they doing it to try to get a better trade deal with the US? Is it that simple or no? Well, it disappoints me to see the UK act as kind of lackeys of the... It's, it's sad to know it's not the heyday of the British Empire, but it's one of the largest economies in the world. Major financial center. Nuclear power. I mean, it's not like it's a tertiary power, but I see what's going on. But I have to say I don't understand it. I don't see why the UK can't go their own way a little bit. But they are, so they're not. But not to get too immersed in the positive. You can pretty much lay the entire Ukrainian tragedy at Biden's feet because Ukraine would not. Russia would not have invaded Ukraine in February of 2022 if they hadn't been provoked for 14 years. I mean, going back to 2008. So what happened in 2008? George W. Bush stands up at a NATO summit and says Georgia and Ukraine should join NATO. He just said that. Three months later, Putin invades Georgia. That's right. 2008 Olympics. So Bush says Georgia and Ukraine should join NATO. Putin almost immediately invades Georgia and takes the place over. It's like, were you not paying attention? Did you not get the message? And we had the global financial crisis and a lot else. So fast forward to 2014. What happens? They have an election in Ukraine. A pro-Russia, pro-Putin president wins. You can debate election. How high quality was the election? You can say, I don't like the guy, but he won. There actually was an election. And within months, the MI6 and CIA, working with neo-Nazi elements in Ukraine, and they've been there since the Second World War, overthrow the guy. They basically had the Maiden Square Color Revolution, so-called, which is all orchestrated by the intelligence agencies. They got snipers. They're killing people. The anti-Russian Ukrainians were doing the killing. And then the guy flees for his life, goes to Russia, and the US installs a puppet. Wasn't Soros funding vice to go there and cover it in the central square? Correct. Yeah. And Victoria Dolan's behind the whole thing. She's got blood coming out of her mouth. I don't. So Putin's like, wait a second. We had an election. The pro-Russian guy wins. And you stage a coup, de facto coup, and kick him out and put in a puppet. So what does Putin do next? He invades Crimea or Nexus. Crimea takes it over. So it's like, okay, Georgia should join NATO. He invades Georgia. Ukraine should join NATO. We just had a coup. He takes over Ukraine. Are you not paying attention? You meaning the West, us, UK. Are you not paying attention to what's going on here? And then they sponsored anyway, without getting. They sponsored attacks on the Russian-speaking part of Ukraine, etc. So by Putin's at the end of his rope now. Yes, he did invade. At a very high level, I would say there are numerous challenges and obstacles. We'll discuss all of them in detail. People attribute words to you and sometimes give you the reputation of being a pessimist. Jim Rickards is always discussing the apocalypse which I do not. I never use that term, but I emphasize that despite the hardships, we don't have to be victims. We are not powerless. We don't need to withdraw from challenges. The crucial thing is to anticipate them. If you can foresee upcoming events, you can address them appropriately. You can navigate through them, not only preserving your wealth, but also potentially profiting. I frequently cite the case of Ugo Stinis, and people might ask, who is he? He was an industrialist in Weimar, Germany, in the early 1920s, and he could foresee hyperinflation long before the middle class or anyone else. He borrowed a substantial amount of Reichsmarks, which was the currency at the time, and invested in industrial assets such as coal mines, vessels, and natural resources. When hyperinflation arrived, he allowed some time to pass, then repaid his debts. I would say he paid back a negligible fraction of the original debt, almost insignificant, but he repaid it while the currency was essentially worthless. He retained all the assets and eventually became the wealthiest individual in Germany. Germany. My German skills aren't excellent, but his nickname was the Inflation, signifying the Inflation King. There are other similar stories as well, like Joseph Kennedy during the 1929 crash. So, once again, we are not powerless. We can take action. But the key to empowerment, as I often stress, is anticipation.
Again, this is where thorough analysis plays a crucial role. You might wonder, am I more intelligent than others? Of course not. Many brilliant minds exist, but people often rely on flawed models. There's a lot of behavioral psychology behind it, such as confirmation bias and the belief that the future will resemble the past, which is often not the case. So, if you adhere to those models, you'll likely achieve poor results. It's difficult to think of an institution with a worse track record in forecasting than the Federal Reserve. The U.S. Federal Reserve and perhaps the IMF is an exception. Both have notably poor records. You could almost take the Fed's forecasts, do the opposite, and do just fine. There's more to it, but they tend to adhere to these flawed models. However, if you comprehend how the economy genuinely functions, understanding that it's a complex dynamic system, my approach is to apply complexity theory. Complexity theory has been around for quite some time, dating back to the Big Bang, the ultimate complex dynamic paradigm shift or phase transition that occurred around 13 billion years ago. However, the mathematical understanding of complexity theory emerged in the early 1960s. It has found successful applications in physics and other fields. I simply transferred it to capital markets, recognizing that capital markets are among the most complex dynamic systems, and adding human behavior to the mix further increases the complexity. These models work brilliantly when you have the right ones, but convincing others to understand and employ them can be challenging. Once again, the point is that with the right models, which should include behavioral psychology, a significant dose of history, complexity theory, and other branches of applied mathematics, you can achieve exceptional results. On the other hand, sticking with models like the Phillips curve and the non-accelerating inflation unemployment rate, as the Fed does, is likely to lead to errors. Does the future have some degree of resemblance to the past? Not always. In fact, it may occur less frequently now than ever before. Additionally, these models assume that prices change continuously. Prices fluctuate, of course, but markets don't always move smoothly. When they do, it often happens when you're not paying attention. When you are, they experience sudden gaps, either up or down, you might blink, and the market is at an entirely different level. Having been revalued, even though you can still enter or exit, you may have gained or lost a substantial amount of money in the blink of an eye. Considering these characteristics, and this is how I began to deconstruct the conventional wisdom, I realized that markets are not efficient, which is a flawed notion. They don't move continuously and gradually. They gap. If you're unprepared for this, you'll miss opportunities. Nothing in this context is entirely risk-free. So, I started there. I began identifying the factors that, in my view, inaccurately applied. You might ask, what resembles these characteristics? The answer is a complex dynamic system, the kind that generates hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning strikes, power outages, earthquakes, and tsunamis. All these phenomena result from complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. The ground suddenly shifts beneath you. Similarly, in financial markets, sudden and significant shifts occur. Therefore, I started to consider this as a more accurate model. Of course it is. Everything continually evolves. Another intellectual tool I use, which involves applied mathematics, is Bayes' theorem. Without delving into excessive detail, I learned about Bayes' theorem during my time at the CIA. I always say that if you have all the facts, a smart high school student can solve the problem. However, intelligence agencies and individuals in capital markets must solve problems when they don't possess all the facts. They have no choice. It's a matter of national security and defense or preserving one's financial well-being on Wall Street. You can't simply throw your hands up and say, I'll wait for more facts to emerge. That approach doesn't work in the real world. Janet Yellen seems a bit detached from this reality. So, how do you solve problems when you lack complete information but still need to address the issue because it's approaching you? Bayes' theorem suggests assigning an initial probability and a priori assumption. You don't invent it, but you do your best, recognizing that you're working with incomplete information. If you have no facts at all and it's a binary outcome, a sign of 50-50 probability, it's not precisely 50-50, but for a binary decision like red or black on a roulette table, it's slightly less than 50-50, but close enough. You say, it's either going to be red or black, I don't know which, so I'll assign a 50-50 probability. Subsequently, as new facts 
facts emerge, you update your model. Your probability either increases or decreases. If it decreases by a substantial amount, you discard that assumption, recognizing it was incorrect. You start over. However, if it increases, you're making it more likely that your initial assumption was correct. Over time, you can raise that probability to 80% or 90%, which isn't 100%, but it's quite robust. There's a crucial aspect to consider while updating, which was explained to me by Henry Kissinger. Imagine a simple graph where the vertical axis represents the probability of a specific outcome and the horizontal axis represents time or the amount of information you possess. Initially, at the start, you have little to no information, but you have ample time and flexibility. However, as you progress along the timeline, your information increases, which is a positive development, but you have less time and flexibility. Your probability curve rises while your time curve descends. When you reach the opposite end, you have perfect information, but it's too late to act. The opportunity has passed or the crisis has unfolded. So the goal is to find the sweet spot in the middle, which I refer to as the Kissinger cross. In this zone, you have sufficient information to make informed decisions and enough time to act deliberately. You seek this sweet spot and with a touch of humility, it becomes a powerful tool. In the CIA, you never have enough information. You're always striving to gather more, yet you must make assumptions and forecasts because you can't afford to wait for 10 9 11 events to have a substantial statistical basis. You're dealing with the one event you have, and your aim is to prevent the next one. Jim Rickards discusses the power of narratives in shaping economic behavior. He references Robert Schiller's book on narrative economics, highlighting how narratives, whether true or false, can influence economic decisions. Rickards refers to the Great Depression, noting how the narrative of frugality prolonged economic distress until a shift in mindset towards spending led to recovery. He emphasizes the White House's failed attempt to push a positive economic narrative, despite contrasting harsh realities, pointing out inflation issues predating the war in Ukraine, and attributing energy price hikes more to domestic policy decisions than geopolitical conflicts. People hear the government say the economy is fine or unemployment is near an all-time low, which is actually, statistically, is true. They, they kind of nod and go, yeah, it's all good. And then reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four. You know, the propaganda is positive. We could talk about that a little more detail. The reality is harsh and reality wins. And there's a very good book on this by Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale University. Not a huge fan of your garden variety PhD economist, but there are some good ones out there. And he's one of them. He wrote a book about, oh, two years ago, maybe a little bit less, called Narrative Economics. He said, yeah, we got all the models in Phillips curve and wealth effect and various quantity theory of money. And some have a place. Some are more valuable than others. But don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's a fancy name for a story, but a story that persists, that grows. And interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SIRE model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? E for exposed. Are you exposed to it? I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? The difference between I and R are people who died. But it's a model when it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, just something that spreads. And it can be very powerful. And then eventually it may die out or reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. That much I knew. But what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful. But a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. He gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions. But there was a period from 1929 to 1933, election of Franklin Don and the Roosevelt. And then there was another period from 1933 to 1937. The 37 and 1940 part we leave aside for this purpose. But during the first part of the Great Depression, unemployment was high, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. 
There were a lot of people with a lot of money at the time, but it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative. But it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending. That kind of can boost the economy out of a depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, was elected in 1933, became president, 34, the psychology turned 180 degrees, and all of a sudden, the Democratic campaign song was Happy Days Are Here Again, and FDR seemed to solve the banking cries and so forth. And all of a sudden, it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%, while 15% is still painfully high. But it was a big move in the right direction. So he describes how the narrative flipped from don't spend money, it's poor form, to yeah, Go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model, but it doesn't fit into any of the standard macroeconomic models. But it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative, and they're failing badly. But they'll say, if you listen to deliberations among White House officials, some of the stuff leaks to the press. And I know some of these people. It's like the economy is great. Unemployment is really low. We've created all these jobs since the pandemic, but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is, they're inside the White House. They're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out the correct analysis, is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. And this is why I say the propaganda from the White House, if things are great, is at ODs with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because, as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So if everything was great until February 27, and then Russia invades, and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up, all right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This inflation goes back to late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. So it predates the war, number one. Energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason is not because Putin invaded Ukraine. It's because the U.S. counterattack with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada, into the United States, where it would connect at a hub. I believe it's in Kansas, but somewhere in the central United States then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada, then ended new leasing, oil and gas exploration, leasing on federal lands, handicapped. The franking industry took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, etc., to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with oil prices doubling or tripling, really from $40 to $120 in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, guess we need more oil. And so he wants to reopen leasing. I said they shut down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere, and we're begging him for oil. Say, why don't we drill our own oil? Because we were a net exporter up until 2021. And then Biden came in and we lost that edge and became a net importer. 
including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. So you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted. But don't be misled by the headlines, because they're, again, this narrative. I think I can keep this brief in the sense that a lot of what's going to affect the stock market is the geopolitical situation. So we talked about that in depth. But if you got a you're just buying the S&P 500 index from Vanguard or Fidelity, and it's been going up. And it has been going up. There's no question about that. And you're like, I'll just sit there and watch it go up. Be careful. It's, we've been warning about a stock market decline for a long time. It's happening. I mean, by the way, the NASDAQ people forget this because Wall Street is out to sell your stocks. And CNBC says up. The NASDAQ peaked in November 2021. Go look at a three-year chart and say what was the all-time high of NASDAQ. It was November 2021, and it's been down ever since. Now, it went down and came back, and it's going down again. Okay, there's volatility. And if you're a day trader, fine, good for you. Good luck trying to pick the spots. But the fact is, it's been going down for almost two years, and it's going down pretty heavily now because the error is out of the tech balloon. There's nothing I see that's going to make that better. I don't think the Fed's done raising interest rates. We'll talk more next week about what could happen. Yeah, and I remember the 1970s. The stock market peaked. Dow Jones peaked in 1969. It didn't get back to that peak until 1982. Now, okay, 1982 was the beginning of one of the greatest bull markets in history. Grant that. But 69, 82 is 13 years. It went sideways. Now, again, there's volatility in dips and peaks. I'm not saying you can't make money, but I'm saying that there's a 13-year period when the stock market ended up where it started. Number one, around 1,000 on the Dow. And when you adjust for inflation, because we had massive inflation in the late 1970s, it was still down. So that's 13 years. Well, we're two years into this dip, and the NASDAQ is nowhere near where it was two years ago. That's the first thing that's going to get worse, because the US is heading into a recession, and we may be in a recession. Everyone's like, Wait a second. Yesterday, GDP was up 5%, and it was, that was the number. It was the first government estimate for the third quarter of 2023. It was up 5%, but it was very heavy on consumption and very heavy on inventory. So when those two things, well, consumption, obviously, people don't realize when wholesalers and distributors build up inventory. That counts as GDP. Well, it's fine to build up inventory if people are buying the stuff. But if they don't buy the stuff and you're up to the rafters in inventory, you got to start writing it down. This is where you see, you go to the Gap and you get like 10 shirts and 5 pairs of jeans for $30. I mean, this is what happens. They slash prices. They do two for one sales. They just move the merchandise. And particularly in certain areas, stuff goes out of style. And the fashion industry is notorious. Who wants last year's coat or whatever? So then the inventory situation comes down to the consumer. Are people buying stuff? It looks like the consumer hit the brakes in August. Now, the second quarter is July, August, September, sometime around mid to late August, after two pretty strong months, and they were strong. The consumers just hit the brakes. Now, they had done enough to make the third quarter strong, but going into the fourth quarter, they may just not show up for the game. A couple of reasons for that. You go back to 2020, 2021, what was going on? Well, Starting with Trump in, I think, June 2020, he gave everybody a $1,400 check. If you got a heartbeat, you got a check. And then Trump did it again in December, just before he left office. It was another $600 check Biden comes in and says, well, I can top that. And Biden does in February 2021, right after he was sworn in, here comes another $1,600 check. And then there was build back. Better? The Inflation Reduction Act, which is actually the greenest scam. We were spending too, well, not spending. We were running deficits of $2 trillion a year for about four or five years. The total spending was higher than that. But that was, the deficit alone was about $2 trillion, a no Nancy Pelosi handing out money. Well, the Americans got used to that. Thanks for the check. And then there was a deferment on student loans. You didn't have to pay your student loans for about at least two years, maybe a little bit longer. And then when people got those checks, they saved a lot of it. So what happened in 2023? People drew down their savings. The savings rate got really low. 
like 3%. It was up around 13% during the pandemic. It's about a little over 3%, 3.5% right now, which is low. They spent the savings they had, they didn't make new savings, and then they turned to the credit cards and ran up their credit card balances. Well, that feels good for a while. But then if you're paying the minimum and rolling over the balance and you're at your limit, your credit limit is used up and the interest rates are 20%, some of them are 28%, you're going to double that balance in three years. If you're like, I'll just pay the minimum this month and I'll figure it out, your balance is going up because the interest is compounding faster than you're paying it down at 2020, 5%. So people are tapped down on their credit cards, they've used up their savings, they're getting into a deeper hole because the interest is compounding faster than they can pay off the credit cards and they're just backing away. And it's showing up in things like gasoline consumption. It's way down. Gasoline is what economists call the demand for gasoline is what economists call inelastic, meaning you just have to buy it no matter what the price is. You got to take the kids to school or get to work or go shut whatever it is. You're just going to buy the gasoline even if you don't like the price. By the way, lately price has been coming down a little bit, which is another. That sounds good, but it's actually a bad sign because it's disinflationary which kind of leans in the direction of a recession. But for gasoline consumption to drop, forgetting about the price, that means people are not driving. They're not going on vacation. They're not doing road trips. They're not driving any more than they have to. There are a lot of other signs. We don't have time to get into all the technicals with negative swap spreads and inverted yield curves and all the rest. But it does look like the consumer slammed on the brakes around late August, early September. The fourth quarter could be a disaster. The stock market is starting to wake up to that fact. So I would say it's a pretty simple recommendation, Matt. Reduce your exp The first point I would make is that global recessions are rare. Recessions in individual countries or economic communities like the EU do happen with some, uh, some frequency, but a global recession is different. Uh, it's usually the case that even when uh, a large group is in recession, somebody else is expanding. China, you know, the 70s, they used to, 1970s used to call the U.S. the locomotive. You know, if Germany was in recession, somehow the U.S. could kind of power through, although the U.S. itself had three recessions between 1974 and, and 1982. But a world recession is rare. Uh, we had one in uh, around the time of the 2008 financial crisis, even though Australia did power through it okay. Uh, and uh, certainly in 2020, during the pandemic lockdowns, but they're unusual. As I say, it's usually one, one group is in a little bit of trouble, but another group powers through and even can pull the recession country or group out of difficulty. But um, when global GDP declines, that's rare. We are heading for uh, exactly that. To understand that, let's um, let's take a look at some of the, the largest uh, economic uh, groupings. And I'll start with the, uh, the United States. Now, the United States had a mild recession in the first half of 2022. If you blinked, you missed it. First quarter GDP was negative, uh, not a lot, about 1.6%. Um, a second quarter GDP was also negative, about nine tenths of 1%. So first half as a whole, uh, we had negative GDP. The rule of thumb definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. That's the rule of thumb. We had that. It's in the data. Having said that, it was mild. And third quarter GDP uh, and fourth quarter bounced back. Uh, but if there was a recession, it was mild. What I'm talking about is a much more severe recession, uh, much, much more difficult, uh, much sharper drop in economic output uh, beginning about now with rising unemployment, uh, slowing industrial output, uh, slowing retail sales, and importantly uh, for investors, uh, a very sharp decline in inflation. So this is one of the kind of mystifying points about the US stock market. I mean, it seems straightforward to me, but market has their own dynamic. They're saying, well, um, if the Fed raises rates the way I've described and they cause a recession, the Fed's going to have to cut rates. That's called the pivot, the Fed pivot, and lower rates are good for tech stocks or buy stocks. But think about that for a second. What if inflation comes down faster than the Fed thinks? And I think it may, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that. What if inflation comes down really fast uh, and they get to the, the target rate sooner than they think? Um, does that mean they might have to cut? Well, it, it might, 
But what's good about that for stocks? I mean, if that happens, no one ever says, why did that happen? They just say, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, so buy stocks. It's like, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, but if it does, it's because we're in a very severe recession, exactly what I'm forecasting. And so if that's the case, stocks are gonna plunge, you know, 30, 40, 50%. So don't root for lower rates, or if you're forecasting lower rates, understand what that means. It doesn't mean the Fed chickened out, doesn't mean life is wonderful and you should buy tech stocks. It means that we're in the very severe recession that I described, and I think we will end up there. Uh, and therefore, stocks are going to plunge. So, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for, as they say. Um, my forecast is, yeah, they are going to raise rates. Uh, they're going to over tighten. They're going to cause a very severe recession. Um, and when they do, they may pivot at that time, but it won't be for good reasons. It'll be for very bad reasons, meaning we're in a recession and stocks have plunged. So don't don't buy into the Wall Street chatter as far as uh, as far as that's concerned, because they say the Fed's going to over tighten. Now, why doesn't the Fed know this? Well, because they never know, because they have the worst forecasting record of any institution I can think of. Their, their entire history since 1913 is one blunder after another. Uh, and this will just be the latest uh, in a long series. And so just to kind of summarize um, the Fed's. On a course, we know exactly what it is because they told us. All you have to do is listen to them and believe them. They're going to raise rates, let high rates do its work, do their work, um, and see the inflation come down and maybe in 2024 cut rates. Uh, what I expect is they are going to raise rates for the next couple of meetings, exactly as I've described, but they're going to over tighten. The signs of recession are, are already present. The Fed's not looking at them. I'll come back to what they are, by the way. Uh, and we'll be in a very severe recession for a lot of reasons. And that's going to mean a plunge in stock prices. So if the Fed cuts rates, don't cheer too loudly because it'll be in a world where um, uh, severe recession, higher unemployment and crashing stock prices are the norm. I like to uh, finish on a, uh, can't call it a happy note, but global liquidity crisis. Now, I talked about a global recession and people go, well, isn't, isn't that like your liquidity crisis? No, uh, a recession or a depression um, is very different than a liquidity crisis or a financial panic. They're two different things. They can, can and do happen separately. In 2008, we had both. In 2008, a recession or depression and a financial panic converged. So they can happen together, but they don't have to. They can happen individually. What we're, what we're in for looks like a global financial crisis and a global recession at the same time coming sooner than later. Now, why do I say that? Um, there's a global dollar shortage. People go, wait a second. The Fed printed $9 trillion, uh, which they did in 2020. It's come down since then, but they did print that much money. Uh, how could there be a global dollar shortage? Well, what people don't understand is that behind the curtain, off balance sheet, this is off balance sheet. You got to go read the footnotes and understand what you're reading. There are one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And for those not familiar with the Q word, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So I just said the Fed printed $9 trillion. Maybe it's down to $7 trillion. Yeah. But you have a thousand trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and they have to be supported with collateral. Not 100%, not even 10%. I mean, kind of 1% or 2% is enough. But when you're in a liquidity crisis, banks are extremely choosy about which collateral they'll accept to support this quadrillion dollar inverted pyramid of derivatives. Um, and right now, what they're saying, because this evolves, it gets worse. It doesn't happen overnight. It can become acute overnight, but it happens over the course of a year or longer. What we see, the banks are saying, I, I, don't, want, I don't want corporate bonds as collateral. I don't want your mortgages as collateral. I don't even want 10-year treasury notes as collateral. The only collateral I want are, are short-term U.S. Treasury bills. Treasury bills have a maximum maturity of one year, 360 days, but there can be four-week bills, eight-week bills, six-month bills, et cetera. That's the, only, that's the best form of collateral. It's the most liquid, easily traded, low volatility, easy to repledge. It's by far the best form of collateral. That's all the banks want right now. But if you're a foreign bank, you need dollars to buy the dollar-based collateral. If you want treasury bills that are denominated in dollars, you need dollars to buy the bills. That's why the U.S. dollar is so strong. People go, wait a second. You know, the U.S. has a you know a multi-trillion-dollar annual budget deficit, uh, a massive trade deficit, a uh, hundred and thirty. 2% debt to GDP ratio, $31 trillion in debt. Um, you're going into recession. How can the dollar be so strong? 
The answer is everything I just said has nothing to do with the demand for dollars in international foreign exchange markets. What's driving the demand for dollars is the need to get dollars to buy dollar denominated collateral, specifically treasury bills, to post as collateral to support the one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And that's going to persist for until the system crashes, which is in the process of doing. I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing, and fiscal policy will fail, is in the process of failing, even if gold didn't exist. If you didn't have gold as a you know, multi-millennial monetary standard, even if gold wasn't there as a reference point, which of course it is, but these policies are failing anyway, and there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, whenever I hear you know, fiscal stimulus, I say, well, no, the Fed can print money all day long and the Congress can spend money all day long, but don't call it stimulus. It's not going to have any stimulative effect. We're way, way past the Keynesian multiplier, which is now below one, meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some numbers, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now uh, you know, a divide or something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New Keynesians, the Austrians and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning some do it more successfully than others more <laughs> accurately than others but they try i was i would say that yeah people say you know the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events for what they see in the future and yeah they look into the future here's the forecast they pick out a discount factor they they present value it and say here's where, where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be you know six months or a year from now and that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically except they're always wrong about the forecast you, you got to get the forecast right <laughs> if the discounting process is going to mean anything so markets go through the process but they always get the future wrong they, they're, they're not very good at predictive analytics so um this creates what i call the gap between the perception and the reality reality always wins but not right away sometimes it takes a while gold on the other hand as very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are gonna be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, uh, you know, result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's, yes. well, I, I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes to go into the analytics behind that. I, as I've said before, you've heard me say, I don't, I don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. And there's a number of different techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So, so you know, it's got to go to 3,000 before it gets to 15,000. It's got to go to 5,000 before it gets to 15,000. So that's my kind of long range forecast. But you know, it could go down tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't get depressed when it goes down. I don't get euphoric when it goes up. I know where it's going in the long run. That's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money, you know, nothing wrong with making money. I'm all for it. But, uh, but sometimes preserving wealth you know, and risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run. But uh, either way, gold will serve that purpose and, uh, you know, and preserve wealth over, over that uh, over that time period. Could it go down tomorrow? I guess. Yeah. But all the vectors are pointing up uh, very strongly. And I'll give you a, a concrete example. There are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally. Uh, one that you've already mentioned, which is real interest rates. The lower the real interest rate, the higher the price of gold. Number two, supply and demand. You know, you learn it in your first three days in economics, but it, it still works. Uh, and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk. 
you know, call it risk off or fear fact, whatever you want to call it, but I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, it, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, like really smart people, uh, Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all and I, I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history and short bonds and the interest rates have nowhere to go but up. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 4%. That's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever, but I usually use the 10-year note rate, 10-year uh, treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's what, about 70 basis points today. Etc. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But, you know, I remind people in 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings were tax deductible and the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after-tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested in whether the Fed's gonna pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland, Japan, a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily th wants to go there but you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year note just when that, whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons it's a negative yield to maturity so you can get there you can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading regardless of what the fed does and that will happen and so you know in the dbo one dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level of rates gets lower that's just you know duration just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield to maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, and we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when they, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation, and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as Exhibit A. I, we should probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. Well, what is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%, but then it spiced to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy. If you can convert savings into investment, and furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing, uh, but I was, we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D, that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, the velocity is zero. And I remind people $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And so the question is, how do you, how do you change the psychology? How do you get the, and by the way, it makes sense to say, if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried, maybe I'm next. You know, maybe they fired a guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next. And so maybe I better save more just in case, you know, and so forth. So, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense. 
but understand what it means. It's deflationary, it reduces velocity, it offsets the increase in the money supply, and it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called a liquidity trap, and he was right, that's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need you need something big, you need something dramatic that's gonna get people to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, one of them would be a $5,000 price for gold. What has been happening in the U.S. economy? The Fed prints all this money, yet that money doesn't lose a lot of value. Look at the exchange rate of the dollar versus other currencies. We've had this massive explosion of money printing, big increase in the Fed's balance sheet. But on a relative basis, the dollar hasn't lost a lot of value relative to other currencies, despite the fact that we've dramatically increased the supply. Imagine if the United States existed as an island. We didn't trade with any other nation. So any money the Federal Reserve printed just stayed within our borders. It didn't go anywhere, right? And so the only stuff you could buy with the money the Fed printed was the stuff that we made here domestically because that was the only source of goods. Well, obviously the effect would have been much different because if the Fed prints a bunch of money and we don't have any stuff, we're not producing, we don't have factories making stuff, then the prices are obviously going to go way up. But there was kind of like an escape valve that allowed the Fed to print a lot of money and it not push up the price of goods. And that was the fact that we have a whole world out there that was able to produce the goods that the U.S. economy couldn't. And we were able to take all the money that the Federal Reserve printed and then use that money to buy all those goods that were made outside the United States. So the Fed prints money, right? the government gets it, sends it to Americans. Americans take that money and buy Chinese goods with it. And now the Chinese send us their goods and we send the Chinese our money. So the money the Fed creates is shipped abroad. So it's not in America bidding up prices, but now the goods that the Chinese produced they get shipped to America. So now we have all those extra goods to keep a lid on prices. And if you look at the breakdown of the CPI between goods and services, if you just look at services, you've seen a substantial increase in prices, even with the government rigging the CPI, because the cost of services has actually risen by more than what the government admits. But if you strip out goods, you'll see a much bigger increase in prices. Why? Because we can't easily import those services. There isn't a foreign alternative. You can't outsource that stuff because the services have to be performed locally. But when it comes to goods, more and more goods have been outsourced to cheaper production economies like China. And so that's kept the lid on goods prices. And so when you average the goods prices with the service prices, that's kept the measured rate of inflation lower. I mean, think about the low production costs in a country like China, which, you know, 20 years ago, they were just starting out. They went through a long period of time where they had a communist system, not just in name, but in practice. And so you had a lot of very poor people. And as they began to embrace capitalism, Wages started at a very low level, and of course, they didn't have a lot of the rules and regulations that we had. Uh, they didn't have all these environmental protections, and so the cost of manufacturing and the cost of labor, capital was all much lower in a country like China, and so we were able to outsource that production in order to keep costs down, even as the Federal Reserve was printing money. And of course, the money that we were printing, we were sending abroad. See, now normally this wouldn't work because if you ran a big trade deficit, like the one the US is running, your currency would crash because your trading partners would have all this currency, but they'd have nothing to buy because the whole purpose of trade is that you export to import. You have a concept of comparative advantage. And if as a nation, there are certain things that you can produce efficiently and there are other things that you can't, rather than producing everything, you produce just what you can make efficiently and then you trade that for the things that you don't produce efficiently because maybe your trading partner can produce that more efficiently. And so by everybody concentrating on what they make efficiently and then trading everybody ends up 
with more stuff, higher living standards, lower prices. But the goal of your exports is to pay for your imports. You don't just export for the sake of exporting. That's just a waste of resources. You export to pay for your imports. But what about America? You've got China and other countries exporting to the United States. They're not getting imports. They're getting dollars. And because the U.S. is the reserve currency, those dollars are actually valuable. And so our trading partners are content or have been in the past to exchange the products that they produce for the money that we print. Now, their willingness to continue to do that and pursue this arrangement, I think, is coming to an end. I think the world is going to tire of exchanging real goods for our paper, especially when they understand how much less that paper is going to be worth in the future than it is now when they realize the box that the Fed is in with respect to its ability to control inflation and the fact that government deficits are going to keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, putting more and more pressure on the Federal Reserve to monetize those deficits. And in fact, the reason that the deficits were able to get so big in the first place was because of this arrangement, because foreigners were willing to hold on to our U.S. treasuries and keep interest rates artificially low that emboldened the government to go even deeper into debt, because normally a government that was this profligate would be punished by higher interest rates and that punishment would change their behavior and cause more fiscal responsibility. But we never got punished. And as a result of that, we continue to pursue even more reckless policies than we had in the past. And so foreigners actually helped encourage this. And ultimately now they're going to be the ones that are going to put on the brakes because they're going to stop enabling all of this debt. But It's going to be the Federal Reserve that is going to ultimately replace foreign buyers of U.S. treasuries. But of course, when foreigners buy U.S. treasuries, there's no new dollars created. They buy treasuries with the dollars that already exist. But when the Federal Reserve has to buy those treasuries, they have to produce even more dollars to finance it, which is inflation. And of course, if those dollars stay here, if they're not exported, then they are going to be bidding up prices. And this is what Powell doesn't understand. We are not going to be able to continue to export our inflation to the degree that we did. And we're going to start to see goods prices rising now. And of course, even if the Fed hadn't increased the pace of its money printing, the benefits of outsourcing our production to countries like China was bound to diminish over time as Chinese wages go up, as production costs go up. There is less of a benefit of continuing to shift production abroad. And of course, as we've shifted more and more production abroad, there's less incremental benefit from shifting more. See, in the early days of outsourcing, we got a lot of bang for the buck. But over time, that impact is lessened. And so the benefit that we got of having our consumer prices reduced as a result of that is also getting diminished. So it was going to happen anyway, but we've now dramatically accelerated it.